A Guide to Cardiac Vasoactive Drips Part 1 The Shock States Hi everybody and welcome back to the Farm Easy Tutor. Today we're going to start our journey to learn about the cardiac vasoactive drips. In Part 1, I'll provide you with some background information on the receptors that vasopressors act on, and I'll also define what shock is and review the four different types of shock and discuss their management. This will be a short video, but it's an important one because it provides the necessary background to understand vasopressor use. Here's part one, the shock states. Here's what we will cover in this four part lecture series. In part one, we'll discuss the shock states. Part two, we'll cover vasoconstrictors used for shock, the catecholamines. Part three, we'll talk about vasoconstrictors used for refractory shock and rescue agents. And in part four, we'll finish off talking about inotropes used for heart failure and vasodilators used for malignant hypertension. In any discussion about cardiac drugs, we need to first start off by reviewing where these agents work, namely at receptors in the heart and blood vessels. The first type of receptors that we need to talk about are the adrenergic receptors. The most important adrenergic receptors are the alpha-1 receptors that are located in the vasculature, in the arteries and veins, and when activated, they cause vasoconstriction in the periphery. The second most important type of adrenergic receptors are the beta receptors, and there are two types, beta-1 and beta-2. Beta-1 receptors are located in the heart, and when activated, increase heart rate and myocardial contractility chronotropic and inotropic effects. Beta-2 receptors are located in the skeletal muscle blood vessels, in the coronary arteries, and in bronchial smooth muscle. When they are activated, they produce vasodilation in the peripheral arteries and bronchodilation in the lungs. Another type of receptor are the dopaminergic receptors, or D1, that are located in arteries in the kidneys. When these dopaminergic receptors are activated, Vasodilation in the kidney occurs, increasing renal blood flow. Two other types of receptors that we will be discussing in part three of this lecture series are the vasopressin receptors V1A that are located in the arterial smooth muscle and when activated cause vasoconstriction. This is in contrast to the V2 receptors that are located in the renal tubules and produce an antidiuretic effect when activated. Another important receptor that has been recently found is the angiotensin II receptor type 1, which is located in many parts of the body, including the heart and vascular smooth muscle. When activated in the vasculature, vasoconstriction occurs. So what is shock? Shock occurs when the cardiovascular system fails resulting in compromised tissue and organ perfusion and inadequate cellular oxygen utilization. So how do we know if a patient has shock? Here are the three key signs of shock. Number one, hypotension. Systemic arterial hypotension with an SBP less than 90 millimeters of mercury or an MAP less than 70 millimeters of mercury with associated tachycardia occur. MAP can be easily calculated by taking the systolic blood pressure and adding it to two times the diastolic blood pressure, then dividing the sum by three. The second sign of shock is tissue hypoperfusion. The patient will exhibit clinical signs of poor tissue perfusion to the skin, kidneys, and brain. The skin will be cold and clammy with cyanosis and mottled extremities. Oliguria with a urine output of less than 0.5 mL per kilo per hour will occur. And the patient will have impaired mentation, obtundation, disorientation, and confusion. The third sign of shock is elevated lactate. Hyperlactaemia is due to abnormal cellular oxygen metabolism. The normal blood lactate level of one millimole per liter increases to greater than 1.5 millimol per liter in shock. When we talk about shock, 
we can categorize it into four different types, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive, also known as vasodilatory. Hypovolemic shock is caused by an internal or external fluid loss of plasma or blood volume. The overall incidence is 16%. Cardiogenic shock results from ventricular failure, such as in acute MI, cardiomyopathy, advanced valvular disease, myocarditis, or cardiac arrhythmias. The incidence of cardiogenic shock is also approximately 16% of all shock cases. Obstructive shock occurs when there is a blockage of blood flow from the heart due to various causes such as pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, or tension pneumothorax. Obstructive shock contributes to only a small 2% of all shock cases. Distributive or vasodilatory shock is primarily caused by septic shock and is the most common form of shock among patients in the ICU. Septic shock contributes to the majority of shock types, occurring in 62%. Other causes of distributive shock could be anaphylaxis, burns, or pancreatitis. In hypovolemic shock, the cardiac output is low because of a decreased preload. Shock after traumatic injury is likely to be hypovolemic due to blood loss. The cardiac output in cardiogenic shock is also low. This is due to significant myocardial dysfunction where the heart is not able to deliver adequate cardiac output to the circulation to maintain perfusion. In obstructive shock, the cardiac output is also low due to an increased afterload seen in pulmonary embolism or a decreased preload in pericardial tamponade or tension pneumothorax. Note that in septic shock, the cardiac output is either normal or high. This is due to the release of inflammatory mediators such as endotoxin and cytokines that cause systemic vasodilation. The resultant hypotension and decreased systemic vascular resistance affecting the circulation can lead to altered tissue oxygen extraction. Here is the complete table that describes the different types of shock. What are the main goals when treating shock? The first is to restore a mean systemic arterial pressure of greater than 65 to 70 millimeters of mercury. The rapid control of hypotension is critical to decrease morbidity. And the second goal is to achieve adequate tissue and end organ perfusion, which is assessed by skid appearance, urine output, and mental status. The initial treatment of shock involves first identifying the cause and then reversing it. Once the cause of shock has been identified, it must be corrected rapidly. In hypovolemic shock, the treatment is to replenish fluids and control any form of bleeding. In cardiogenic shock, cardiac procedures, surgery, or medical devices are utilized. Vasopressors or inotropes may also need to be started. In obstructive shock, relief of the obstruction needs to be performed, for example, thrombolysis for pulmonary embolism. In distributive shock, which is primarily septic shock, the surviving sepsis guidelines are to be followed. We will review this on the next slide. A protocol is necessary because the mortality rate from septic shock is very high, ranging from 35 to 50%. Here are the surviving sepsis guidelines, which are so important to implement in order to reduce the mortality of septic shock. The first step is to manage the infection. Obtain blood cultures before you administer antibiotics and then establish an anatomic source control as rapidly as you can. We then administer broad spectrum antibiotics within one hour after sepsis recognition. For hypotension, or lactate greater than or equal to 4 millimoles per liter, rapidly administer crystalloids. And a minimum of 30 ml per kilo is to be completed within three hours of recognition. We also need to measure lactate levels. And if the lactate level is elevated, 
greater than 2 millimole per liter, we need to remeasure the lactate level within two to four hours. Serum lactate can be a surrogate marker for tissue perfusion. And finally, if the patient is hypotensive during or after fluid resuscitation, start norepinephrine to maintain a mean arterial pressure of greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury. So again, if fluid resuscitation is not adequate, we need to start vasopressors. Shock patients should receive the VIP treatment initially. VIP standing for ventilate, infuse, and pump. Ventilate using oxygen, infusing fluids, and pumping using vasoactive agents. For ventilatory support, the administration of oxygen should be started immediately to increase oxygen delivery and prevent pulmonary hypertension. Endotracheal intubation should be performed to provide invasive mechanical ventilation in patients with severe dyspnea, hypoxemia, or persistent or worsening acidemia. Fluid resuscitation in non-septic shock patients is essential to increase cardiac output and improve the blood flow. A fluid challenge should be used to determine a patient's response to fluids. Usually, it's an infusion of 300 to 500 ml of normal saline administered over 20 to 30 minutes. A positive response after the fluid bolus is to see an increase in systemic arterial pressure, a decrease in heart rate, or an increase in urine output. Administration of too much fluid carries the risk of pulmonary edema. The third part of VIP treatment is the use of vasoactive agents. Early effective hemodynamic support of patients in shock is critical to prevent worsening organ dysfunction and failure. If hypotension is severe, or if it has not responded to adequate fluid resuscitation, circulatory support with vasopressor drugs is necessary to maintain adequate tissue perfusion. Catecholamines are considered first-line vasopressors because of their rapid onset of action, high potency, and short half-life, which allows easy dose adjustment. So let's summarize shock. Shock occurs when severe hypotension with an MAP less than 65 to 70 and associated reduced blood flow to vital organs occur. Perfusion to the brain, kidney, and peripheral tissues is decreased. The initial treatment of shock involves administering adequate ventilation, fluids, and identifying the cause. The four types of shock are hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive. The most common type of distributive shock is septic shock, which represents two-thirds of all shock cases. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign's treatment regimen recommends rapid delivery of antibiotics, administration of 30 ml per kilo of crystalloid fluids, and monitoring lactate levels. If hypotension still persists after initial measures, vasopressors are required. Vasoconstrictors primarily act on alpha adrenergic A1 receptors in the periphery to cause vasoconstriction. Some drugs also activate beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors in varying degrees. Other drugs activate dopaminergic, vasopressin, and angiotensin II receptors. In part two of this four-part series on cardiac vasoactive drips, we will review the catecholamine vasopressors and learn which ones to use first, know which drugs are used for catecholamine extravasation, and briefly discuss refractory shock. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEZ Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else.
We've got a lot in store at the PharmEasy Tutor channel. There will be upcoming talks on pharmacokinetic dosing, treatment of multidrug resistant organisms, TPN, electrolyte management, cold blue emergencies, management of heart failure, and much more. So please stay tuned to us. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.